You know, there was uh, many years ago, there was a patient that came to Caring Medical Illinois from Switzerland, and literally <clears throat> when I had her walk down the hallway, she literally went from one side to the other side. I mean, her balance was terrible. And it was absolutely clear that she had upper cervical instability. Basically, her C1, C2 vertebrae were moving too much. And, you know, we obviously, since that time, have, you know, continued to perfect our technique as far as resolving cervical instability, especially upper cervical instability. And a lot of people out there actually don't even realize all the symptoms that occur with cervical instability. I mean, it's unbelievable. So Danielle, what are some of the symptoms like from cervical or upper cervical instability? There's a whole plethora and they all even sound kind of weird. Like patients will say, okay, I have this crazy thing, you know, where I have eyeball pain. And it really could be related to their upper cervical spine being unstable. So usually um, kind of common things would be like ringing in the ears, eyeball pain, um, even tearing of your eyes, blurry vision, dizziness, you know, vertigo, or you just feel like the room is spinning, balance difficulties, even, you know, stranger things like your tongue goes numb, um, or you might have difficulty swallowing, even get maybe heart palpitations, difficulty speaking, and sometimes there's, there's really a kind of a long list, drop attacks, where you just, all of a sudden, you know, you just fall. Um, what other ones am I missing? No, but I mean, that's, so just to, just for, the folks watching, like even this week, we had a young gal from the Boston area who just, you know, was 18. She's in a high school basketball game. Somebody elbows her. She falls to the ground. She gets up. I'm fine. I'm fine. And then she takes a few more steps. Then boom, she falls oh down. Gosh. She's unconscious for one and a half hours, you know, sees all the people in her community, goes to all the big hospitals in her area. And her symptoms are very bad headaches, like you said, drop attacks, dizziness, ringing in the ears, terrible neck pain. Mm -hmm. And then once in a while she'll wake up and like basically she has a numbness like all over her body. And uh, her MRIs are fine, uh, her CT scans are fine, her x-rays are fine, but yet she has cervical instability. So doctor special, like why can't the regular doctors diagnose her, like why? I think why, what, what, why, do, why, does it, why do people with, often with cervical instability, like they fall through the cracks? Well, they're going through traditional medicine like we've all been trained, okay, and there's, they're excellent doctors. Um, but if they go to a neurosurgeon, a neurologist, they're really focusing on the brain, okay, and, and obviously that needs to be addressed also. But many times they're missing the boat, and it's, it's the neck. And uh, like Danielle and Dr. Hauser were saying, the cervical means neck, and the upper cervical, these, these nerves, it's called their upper cervical sympathetic ganglion. It's a lot of where our reflexes, where we sweat and things like that happen, where our pupils will dilate and constrict. And people don't even realize, they may end up seeing a manual therapist, um, and they may be trying their best. They say, Doc, I'm going to a manual therapist, and it helped temporarily, but then it went worse. And then before you know it, I had to continue to go in maybe multiple sessions. And, um, and then, what's, unfortunately, what's happening, they're, they're cycling and they're almost aggravating the problem. So they, they really need stability. They may go to physical therapy, some excellent physical therapists. So I happen to be a physical therapist also. I did that before becoming an osteopathic physician. And the trouble is, even though they're trying to stabilize the muscles, they haven't got to the core problem. The core problems are tendon and ligament attachments. Once they get healed, with prolotherapy, and that may take some sessions, okay, because there's a lot of, lot of attachments. Um, their symptoms will go away and, and they'll be well. The, uh, you know, we have often talked about that upper cervical instability is like the masquerader, like you had said, you know, it can cause migraine headaches. But a lot of people don't realize it can simulate the same symptoms as post-concussion syndrome or minor traumatic brain injury. So maybe you could, Danielle, say, you know, uh, talk a little bit about that. Like how you know, how does upper cervical instability simulate or? Well, what's interesting, um, if you think about anyone that's ever had a concussion, you know, you, you fall pretty hard usually and hit your head and you maybe lose consciousness a little bit, go to the ER, they say you have, you know, post-concussion syndrome, take it easy, but then sometimes these symptoms never go away. Even if routine brain MRIs and imaging and everything is normal, you still may have this whole, you know, classification of symptoms. Well. If you think about it, when you fall, and yes, you do you know, hit your head really hard, but your neck gets that same pressure. So you almost even get like 
a whiplash scenario in your neck at the same time as the fall. So of course, like Dr. Special said, the brain should be addressed to make sure nothing's going on. But if you're, you know, everything's coming back normal, but you still have these symptoms, you should probably look at your neck, you know, because if you do have this underlying whiplash injury that could very well easily injure all those ligaments that help hold your neck together, and now you've got this instability and all these other weird symptoms, you know, that's often what goes unaddressed. Um, or patients find us and, you know, usually do really well with prolotherapy to help resolve those symptoms, get their neck stability back, and they do great. Dr. Hauser, let me ask you, so the patient comes to you and they have had a cervical um, a neck MRI, and they've had the x-rays and maybe a CAT scan. And then they say, well, I've been to those other doctors and the CAT scan and MRI and my x-rays were normal. Why am I, I saw various physicians, but I'm still having these problems. How come they couldn't help me? Yeah, the tech, well, the technology <laughs> of most radiographs, they don't show ligaments. Like ligaments are like, you know, one centimeter. You know, they're really, really small. So the only radiographs that are gonna show ligament injury often are functional radiographs. So in other words, you have to do an MRI in different positions or you do what's called a digital motion x-ray. So it's very common in our practice to order digital motion x-rays. For instance, when I had my pinched nerve in my neck, when I had neck instability, when I was like this, I had no symptoms down my arm, but it, as soon as I went like this, it would zoom down my arm. So if somebody has a symptom, whether it's a migraine headache, or it's a neck tightness, or it's a zinging down the arm that happens with movement, that's a sign that they have cervical instability. So one of the ways objectively to document that you have cervical instability is a digital motion x-ray, and there's specific ones you know, that, that, that we utilize. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that I think most people don't realize is beside that ligaments don't show up on x-ray is that the cervical vertebrae from C2 to C7, there's discs. So in other words, they get some stability, there's some support in the neck from the disc, but between the head and C1, the top cervical vertebrae, and then between C1 and C2, there's no disc. So literally, your head is supported by two very small bones in a sea of ligaments. So it's like you said, when somebody bangs their head, often when they bang their head, they twist. So in other words, that's how ligaments in the upper cervical spine are injured by this sharp rotational force, which almost always happens with the brain trauma. So we found when we've had college athletes and high school athletes and others that have had diagnosis with post-concussion syndrome, we're not saying it doesn't exist. It does exist, but almost all the symptoms the residual symptoms, the residual dizziness, the residual vertigo, the residual migraine headaches, the residual weird sensations, the prickliness and the numbiness all down the arms is due to upper cervical instability that is very easily treated with prolotherapy. So, and we've often found too, uh, when folks email from long distance, and we're always happy to you know, have people email us so we can tr make sure that they're a good prolotherapy candidate because of course we wouldn't want anybody traveling a long distance and they weren't a good prolotherapy candidate, we'll have them wear a cervical collar. So what, how can that help to determine whether they have cervical instability? Well, and, you know. to even add to what you okay. said before when he said, um, talking about whiplash with, you know, always with your head turned, even research is showing if you're in, a, let's say you're stopped at a stoplight and someone hits you from behind, of course you can get some kind of whiplash injury if they hit you hard enough, but if let's say you're sitting and you're talking to somebody in the passenger seat and they hit you, just even having that extra turn can actually predispose you more to neck injury and so forth with just that extra rotation. Um, but about, back to the cervical collar, so really, you know, if you, if someone has cervical instability, a lot of times it's okay, if I turn my neck to the side, that's when I get the zooming down the arm, or that's when I get, all of a sudden I get dizzy, or my vision goes blurry. If you wear a cervical collar, that's gonna, one, help support the weight of your head, because you think of, now you have these weak ligaments, all these weak structures, and it has to hold, you know, your heavy head, that's a lot on an injured structure. So if you're wearing this collar, one, to help support the uh, weight of your head, and then two, to kind of just help hold your neck in place and really limit this extra rotation. A lot of times, patients with cervical instability, they'll put the collar on, they'll feel great. You know, of course, it's not a, a permanent fix because we should fix that tissue, but that's a good sign that, okay, I, I, I should do well with prolotherapy because by just getting that pseudo-stability, 
uh, to call it, you know, that you do a lot better, then you know that your neck needs some kind of stabilization. You know, tying that in <clears throat> also, Danielle, I found out also maybe there are patients who, uh, that's why a good history is very, very important, that they may have had an injury as a child. They may have fallen downstairs. They may have had some trauma from um, whatever. It could have been a football when they were 15 years old. They could have fallen on bicycle. They didn't even remember right. what happened. And they've had these chronic headaches, neck pain, maybe dizziness, eye complaints, ear complaints, maybe some, maybe all of them. So it's very important for us to talk to them and get a good history. And then they say, aha. And it clicks. And usually those patients, like they've seen the ENT they've for all the, yeah, sure they've they seen have. the ophthalmologist, right. they've seen the neurologist, and no one has any answers, or they've gotten sinus surgery or things that just haven't really right, worked. Right. Yeah. See, what's neat about caring medical, which I get excited about, and remember, it's taken us a long time. We've been doing this for decades. Um, but so, like Danielle was saying, and Dr. Hauser, um, this is upper cervical. And then, but they may have a TMJ problem, temporal mandibular, which is your jaw joint that also ties in with here. They got sprained, strained, and that's also so they may have seen dentists and um, other sort of physicians, okay, uh, and not quite get it right. And that's all tied in with here. So that's why we're comprehensive because many people with cervical problems, which is the neck, will have. If we could show you, it ties in with the shoulder, okay? That's why when people would see other people, they say, well, you just can't treat one joint because everything ties in like a domino. So you have to treat from the neck, and you might have to treat bilateral both shoulders up in this whole cage affects it. And many people might have problems here. Let's go right to the chest area, and they may say, I saw my cardiologist, and here I had a girl, a patient, 15-year-old girl, and they were going to a uh, surgeon, and... Um, she was having some pain under here. They did a $25,000 workup on her, saying she had an enlarged spleen, okay? And the mother just didn't quite feel right, and they were gonna take out her spleen. Oh, uh, spleen like, oh. they were called. Yeah. So she came to me, I examined her, and it was pretty simple, to be quite frank. She had costochondritis. I did her three or four visits, and, and she ended up becoming gymnastic champ of wow. uh, um, you know, her age group and stuff like that for the state of New York. And it was neat, and I, I treated her multiple, you know, multiple things of her afterwards, and, uh, but she obviously didn't need that. She just needed an examination by someone skilled who would touch her instead of just flipping up a film. Mm 